Now if we can all take our seats. And thanks. Just before we um, get started, hopefully you've all got your breakfast. Someone said to me it's like eating on a budget airline, and um, that's the vibe we're going for. So we can't fly, but we can certainly eat food out of a paper bag on our laps uh, when we need to, crammed next to someone else. Um, so before we start, just a bit of housekeeping. This event is being held uh, in person, and we have a number of people, number of members uh, on Zoom. So welcome uh, to the Zoomies. Um, please make sure your mobile phone is turned off. Uh, if you need bathrooms, they're outside uh, and to the right. In case of emergency, there are platform staff who will assist us. Um, I'm not sure where they are at the moment, but um, I'm sure if there's an emergency, they'll come running in. Um, so it's my pleasure to start proceedings by welcoming Auntie Marie Taylor for a welcome to country. Auntie Marie. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to be here today to welcome you all to the most ancient of Aboriginal land in the world, Noongar country. And as we are by the beautiful Swan River, I'll have a little story there later on to share with you. But first of all, let me tell you that we are in the season of Jilba. And the totems for Jilba is Quanet, the black wattle that we sometimes get food from, the leaves we use to wash our hands because it makes soap. And the bird that is the totem for this month is Ngulak. The black, the white tailed black cockatoo, and the beautiful tree that is growing only down here in the south is the Jarrah. And from it, we get all sorts of things. <clears throat> Let me welcome you in the ancient language of the Noongar people, of whom we still maintain and share and teach and revive today. Abba. Wajak Baladong Nunga Bridia Yok Wanju Wanju Nungas Nunga Wom Wajalus Bridia Nichi Yokani of Bibleman Borja Nichi Warding Mat Management Kundam Borja Mut Janabidi Nichi Balapin Weir Mit Yeni Nalakan Yai Ne Karajanan Kura Yai Buddha Greetings, the Aboriginal custodian welcomes you all here to the land of the people of many breast. This is Crow and Cockatoo Dreaming Land, whose families and ancestors tread the grounds, leaving footprints upon the land where their spirit lingers on, surrounding us through stories as we listen, look, learn, talk, and later on we will celebrate and also have a lovely breakfast. Nunakan Kurin Kumbawar and Pokicha, Alija Nuna Borja, you are Kornicha, Yalagonga Borja, Yalagonga Kalip, Wanju. Some of you have come from over the great sea or from your lands afar to come and settle on the camping grounds of our great leader of the past, Yalagonga, and I warmly welcome you here today. <coughs> Share a little story, and it's about two sisters. There is a constellation of three stars that were once known as the three sisters and very probably the three stars of the Orient belt. In the beginning, the three beautiful women who occupied each of these stars decided to come down to earth and look around. While here, one star woman met two young men always depicted as snakes and fell in love with them. Because she had had contact with mortals, she was no longer allowed to return back up to the star world. Therefore, only two star women returned. And now the constellation is known as the two sisters. She who remained then took the form of Wach, the emu, an emu, as a bird that cannot fly, is symbol symbolically a prisoner of the earth, but her role is that of Mother Earth, 
married to and sometimes estranged from Father Sky. <clears throat> I thought I'd just share a little bit, tell a story about my time when I worked at Holmes West Fremantle many years ago, believe me. And um, I was there as the Aboriginal um, housing officer. And when I first started, and I was working with the uh, accommodation managers, as they were called at the time, I found that many of our Aboriginal families were in debt. Many of them were on the verge of being kicked out of their homes. And some of the houses were an absolute mess. So I sat down with a friend of mine who worked for the community services at a time as a resource worker in Coolbala. And we had a meeting and she said, you know, I also work for Uniting House in Fremantle and we could set up bill paying services for all of your clients and have them put on a budget. And that's what we did. If the Aboriginal family and also the non-Aboriginal families had a, a debt, they were referred down to Uniting House, put on a bill paying service. Every Christmas, they would get their Christmas club check to go and spend. During the 10 years that I worked there, we never had one eviction because I worked closely with the community and with families. And I wasn't afraid to stand up and talk on behalf of my people. Somewhere along the line, we've lost the track of how we can support each other. Housing is not just about chucking people out on the streets. Housing is about working with people making sure that they are stay, that they stay in their home, technically forever. And some of my families down in that area, they were on the verge of eviction, especially one of them that lived in Kulbala. <coughs> I was in the process of doing a report up for the minister's office to have the family evicted when an accommodation manager came to me and she said, I've got a house for you for that family. Would you like to relocate them? And I went out and had a look at the house and went back down and said, yes, I'll give you per permission to um, relocate that family. And the manager at the time, he authorised the move. And when we um, shifted the family over to this house, everybody had their thumbs up because we'd shifted the family to Paget Street, Hilton Park, right opposite the police station. And we never had no more problems from that family <laughs> ever again. So sometimes it's about sitting down, talking and working together. And Minister, if you ever need any advice, please come and contact me. <laughs> Let me leave this little blessing with you all, which is the verse of a chorus of a song. Nalakan Kenny Mort, Nalakan Bulla Mort, Nalakan Bulla Bojack, you are a core. Yakan in Nalakundam, Doinch, Doinch Warakan, Nan, Nunak, Nalak, Murich, Mort, Anna. Yes, we are one, but we are many, and from all the lands on earth we come. We share a dream and sing with one song. I am, you are. We are solid Australians. Now, my teams got kicked out of the finals, so I've got to say, good luck, Melbourne. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Annie Marie, for that fantastic welcome. And um, uh, I just want to acknowledge that we are on Noongar Buja. And last night I was at a talk and um, a very wise uh, Noongar elder talked about the word Buja and said it means more than just country. 
you know, it's a, probably the closest translation to Buja might be universe, um, which I thought was much more apt. We should be thinking about country as universe. Um, so this morning, we're delighted to welcome the Honourable John Kerry, MLA, Minister for Housing and Local Government to this breakfast event. Um, and in the Minister's inaugural speech to Parliament, he said, I am an optimist. I'm here because I believe in the capacity of community to come together to drive social change and improve people's lives. And uh, I'm an optimist too, and we're optimistic at Shelter, WA. We know that there are incredible housing challenges facing people across Western Australia. And everyday services are seeing the health, mental health, economic and social impacts of housing insecurity in a market with very limited supply. But we remain optimistic because we know with the right investment and policy settings, solutions are at hand. We also know that through pragmatic, nuanced approaches to housing, we can deliver homes needed. We can strategically plan for and respond to market conditions in partnership with government, industry and the community housing sector. I'm an architect by training and um, optimism is sort of what we do in architecture because we try and imagine a brighter future. Um, and if you weren't an optimist and you had to think about the future, it'd be a pretty bad job to have. Um, so I think that there's a difference though between sort of faith and optimism and optimism sort of implies that you're going to imagine that future and then work towards it. And in the five months since the state election, there has been a significant shift and refocus by the state government and the Department of Communities on housing, um, with the minister demonstrating his passion and strong commitment to social housing and work ethic, I might say, um, which is great news and really positive for the sector. At Shelter WA, we believe that working together in partnership with government, our sector, industry, people with lived experience of housing insecurity and the community, that we can develop and foster an effective housing system, a system that realises the vision that we have and that I'm sure that you all share, that all people in Western Australia have housing that enables them to thrive. So the order of this morning is that the minister is going to make a speech. Luckily, he found it. Um, it was cutting, cutting it short there for a second. Um, we lost the file. Um, make a speech, and then we'll take questions from the floor and also from Zoom. Um, the minister has, I just found this out, it's called an exco, which I didn't know what anyone was talking about when they all seemed to say that, but it means executive council meeting this morning, which means he has to leave uh, on the dot at 8.50. So um, we're very pleased that he could find time in his schedule to join us. Um, and I will be monitoring the mic and at 8.50, we will be cutting it off. Um, so please join me in welcoming Honourable John Kerry, Minister for Housing to the stage. Thanks, Minister. Thank you, sorry. Firstly, thank you, Kieran. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and thank you, Auntie, for that lovely welcome. I think you're controversial uh, to say that you're wishing best luck to Melbourne, uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed your story and I will actually come back to it. Uh, later in the speech. First of all, I do want to just slightly depart from the usual introduction that I make uh, to thank everyone in this room. And I think that uh, it is important to recognise the leadership in this room, particularly during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We can't ignore it. Uh, and obviously for many of us here, uh, with family and friends in New South Wales or Victoria, it is always weighing on our minds. Uh, and what you do appreciate is what an incredible safe haven that we have here in Western Australia. Uh, and that uh, it is because of the collective effort of our state, of our community, uh, that we've been able to achieve this safe haven. But also, I'd the reason why I want to acknowledge the leadership here is that when, and if we can remember right back to January 2020, when there were signs, um, there were doom predictions uh, in relation to the total effect uh, for Western Australia. That was loss of life. Uh, that was about the economy. Uh, that was overall a, a very terrible picture. Uh, and the Premier had indicated that from National Cabinet. And I have to say, 
all elements of our community, but particularly uh, the welfare, social advocacy sector really did kick in um, in relation to that planning, but also uh, when we were in lockdown, right down to assisting people uh, who are rough sleeping on our streets. So I do want to recognise uh, the work and uh, advocacy of the sector. Of course, now we face an alternative scenario, one that we did not imagine, and that is uh, a booming economy. Uh, it is incredible, uh, and even today, uh, we're seeing in terms of economic growth, uh, the unemployment, and so forth. But as we know, and as everyone in this room clearly understands, that uh, with that, uh, there are significant pressures. Uh, the West Australian recently reported about the fact of migration and that we have the highest interstate migration, intrastate migration since 2013. Uh, and as a result, uh, we have seen extraordinary uh, housing construction and demand for housing. 27,000 building approvals, 4,000 under key start. These are extraordinary figures. Uh, that has created a heated construction market. Um, but what it's also meant with that population uh, has been uh, a significant demand in public housing, uh, a tightening of the rental market, which many of you have been advocating for. And so when I've come in as the new minister, it has been very clear to me that the, on the continuum of housing that we have addressed the affordable uh, housing equation at the moment. That in fact, the West Australian reports huge numbers of first home buyers actually entering the market. Uh, there was a figure of buying 71 houses a day for first home buyers. And so I've made it very clear uh, as the new Minister for Housing that my key focus, my key passion is lifting social housing. And I am unrelenting in that focus. Uh, and what that has mean uh, in a, has been to refocus uh, the agency, uh, the Department of Communities. And so what we really have done is uh, from ground up is look at how we can recalibrate our delivery programs, uh, really look at everything that we are doing to, to focus sharply on increasing um, social housing delivery. And I want to be really frank with you, you know, part of the challenges uh, for the agency was the corruption scandal and what that meant for the organisation. And I don't think I have to say that to anyone here who's engaged with the agency. And Michelle Andrews did a fantastic job to refocus uh, the organisation. But as a result, I think it's fair to say that with all the new ranges of governance uh, and, and so forth, that perhaps the organisation shifted too far uh, and that there was so much focus on risk uh, that the actual focus on delivery was perhaps not always there. And that's why as the new minister, we've been going through and looking at particular areas. The first has been the creation of a housing and assets division. And so when I came in as the minister, uh, and this had been inherited, but was that I wanted a far more sharper and clearer line of responsibility about public housing delivery. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, a new structure, new housing and asset division with a deputy director general who is focused on delivery of public housing. Now, he's a great guy, love his work. I'm a big fan of his club. He's right here in the corner and I'm, making, I'm embarrassing him, Mark Bryant. But I don't, uh, hopefully you are picking it up from your interactions, but there is a, a deep focus. Now that has mean, for example, uh, and Mark's background is from the Department of Finance, is looking at procurement ways that we can streamline processes to get the money out the door. Because we do have a big investment program, nearly $1 billion in social housing, public housing, affordable housing. But part of that challenge is getting the money out the door. 
Uh, and that's why we've got now that very clear, dedicated focus. A second focus is vacancies. Uh, now, I understand the opposition has a job to do, and they've got to get you the catcher moments, the political moments to have a go at the government. But the reality in, is that in our public housing system, there is always going to be vacancies. We call it the churn rate. So people come in and they move out, and there is a churn rate. But what I've tasked the department is to go through all those longer standing vacant properties to look at how we can get them back into the system. And for the churn rate, to look at how we can accelerate that shift or that change. And that's particularly in reference to refurbishment programs uh, and those refurbishment programs which are guided under head maintenance contracts. So can we do things like, as we know a tenant is leaving, make an assessment about refurbishment and perhaps do some of it after so that we get the tenant in and we make sure that we house someone uh, as part of that process. So that is the kind of changes that we are really trying to drive internally in the agency so that we're looking at procurement and driving procurement changes. We're dealing uh, with vacancies and we're also looking at the overall business as usual housing program. And I've already flagged on the public record this, uh, that we are looking, investigating, in fact, I have clearly directed the agency to look at modular as an alternative uh, for the traditional brick build. And clearly there is a lot of appeal for modular. Modular in particular in regional uh, communities is something that we can potentially move faster on. Uh, and also modular can be a great option for culturally uh, appropriate accommodation. So it's certainly on my agenda as an alternative to the double brick. Uh, that we can get out public housing at a faster rate. Uh, the other area is looking at land. And I say this genuinely that um, I know a government has a lot of land. Uh, and uh, through all different government agencies, uh, main roads, uh, Department of Communities, planning and so forth. And when I came in as the minister, it was obvious to me that we needed a more strategic approach, a more coordinated approach that we could actually then leverage off uh, better outcomes uh, for the state uh, and for the community. So what we've done is we've established a subcommittee of cabinet of which I am chair. Uh, with the Minister for Lands and with the Minister for Planning. And what we're doing in regards to that is actually making a strategic assessment of land holdings across the metro area. I've already put this on the public record in the parliament, but also in regional uh, Western Australia. But I wanna be frank, and I appreciate the advocacy of Shelter WA, but it's not just simply going along and looking over and saying, oh, that land looks good or that building looks good. It doesn't work like that because we have to be aware of the zonings, uh, the, the other planning policies that are in place, the limitations or contamination of the site. So what we're actually doing at the moment is actually working uh, to look at what available land, how can we deconstrain it? How can we get the planning approvals already in place so that we can actually go out uh, to the market or the community housing sector so that we can actually leverage good social housing outcomes. Again, coming back to how do we deliver from that land good social housing outcomes. Now, as part of that committee's work is also oversight of all the Department of Communities land that is transferring a cost to Development WA. I don't know if you are aware, I'm assuming you are, but as a result of the corruption scandal and machinery of government task force, in effect, all land holdings over um, 30 units are transferring across to Development WA. So that all those large parcels, joint development potential, is in development WA and it makes sense. However, as the Minister for Housing, I wanna make sure that we can best harness that potential. So this 
uh, subcommittee actually still has governance over that land and what it's used for and what we're going to leverage it from. So uh, as the Minister for Housing, I want to assure you, because I've had some concerns, that land is not lost. Uh, it is going through a different vehicle. But this main body is looking at uh, how we can best leverage. And the other part of that, which I think is obvious, is the total social mixed housing policy. So this committee has also been re-looking at, we haven't had a, a formal policy, uh, so different organisations across government, so that mix of affordable, private and social housing. But certainly as the Minister for Housing, I'm trying to look at how we can lift, how we can get better outcomes out of that system. So hopefully you can see that there is some reform program that we have been driving across that in terms of uh, vacant housing, in, in terms of procurement and getting that money out the door, in terms of strategic land use and getting uh, better social housing uh, outcomes. And of course, ultimately, it's about better delivery, better use of that nearly $1 billion uh, for affordable social housing and homelessness initiatives. But I do want to be frank, there are key challenges that we face uh, in regards uh, to this delivery. Uh, and the first is the construction and building boom. Uh, it is difficult. Uh, we do get significant challenges in even getting quotes for our refurbishing of public housing stock. So we all in this room do have to be aware uh, that while modular is clearly part of the picture, in my personal opinion, and driving our policy, that with 27,000 building approvals, this is a constraint. That industry is advising to me that when the pad goes down to actually when the bricks start, there are significant gaps. And that is also being reflective in a skill shortage for Western Australia. That's why we've had a skills summit. That's why we're actually bringing in a range of programs, for example, getting retirees uh, out of uh, retirement, uh, asking them to come back and do bricks or be tradies. Uh, that's why we've, we're targeting apprentices that are falling out of the system. Even down to simple stuff like the lack of licenses for young apprentices, particularly in the regions, and funding a specific program to assist those uh, young, women, young women and men to get their licenses so they can go and help build homes. The second area is public perception. And I do think this is underestimated about community housing. I am a passionate advocate for the social housing sector uh, and very clear in that. But do not underestimate, and it's really become clear to me as the Minister for Housing, the number of people that do not want community and social housing in our community. And I'll be frank, I think sometimes even the sector does underappreciate that. Because I can tell you, Unfortunately, the number of complaints that come through all the community campaigns that are asking me to remove social or public housing in their communities. And even in my own electorate, where I'm looking at how to accelerate social housing, I've got people turning around and saying, we don't want it here. That is a harsh reality. And certainly I want to assure everyone in this room that I will not be bowing to that. I will be fiercely at every opportunity advocating for the delivery of social housing. And in sometimes it will be tough and sometimes it will be contentious, but I will have the sectors back uh, and I will take it up to explain why we do need social housing in our communities. And the third area is the tenant mix. And I, again, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here. But one thing I've made, uh, been very conscious of is going out to the regions, engaging and sitting down directly with regional staff and saying, put the spin to side. You know, don't take me to your best houses. Show me your worst. Show me what's really happening out in the regions. Tell me what's working, what's not working. 
And what you understand very clearly there, and this is a deep appreciation that I've developed, is that the tenants mix and the support programs are critical. It is not, as we know, about just plonking someone in a house. The opposition tells me that's what it's all about. It's not. And that for regional staff, it is pragmatic and nuanced. And I do like the story about putting the social housing outside auntie's uh, social housing outside the police station, but it is actually challenging for regional staff in terms of that social mix in complexes. And I am acutely uh, aware of that. And what also I'm very aware of is, is that we need those strong support programs to keep tenants in the system that thrive. And I am looking at the capacity, the ability of Thrive to deliver, that's a $58 million program to keep tenants in the public housing system. But I do want to see how we can better look at providing support uh, to tenants, particularly domestic violence victims, who often are in the unfortunate circumstances of uh, collecting debt of no fault of their own. And so for me, that is a specific policy area that I do, I have asked the agency to look at at how we can provide better support. And in terms of evictions, I wanna be very clear. It is very easy for a minister to be populist because the number of complaints you get about antisocial behavior. But I am on the record repeatedly. I do not want to see evictions in the social housing and public housing system. We must do everything we can to assist and stop tenants falling out of the social housing system. It is absolutely critical. And again, whether we can rework, recalibrate that Thrive program, but to provide support uh, to, um, to those tenants so we can keep them in, I think is the other critical challenge as part of that uh, tenant mix. Now, I know, uh, as I've indicated, my key priority, my first focus has been on the organisation, has been on the delivery of public and social housing. And I understand the community housing sector and Shelter WA does an outstanding job in its fierce advocacy. But I am flagging as part of that next step after we've reset the department is working with uh, the sector uh, in relation to the policy settings. And post the budget, I will be meeting with key community housing uh, leaders in that regard. I'm also pleased to say as part of SHERP funding, we are releasing $93 million. A media statement's gone out today, timed very well. Uh, but $93 million will be available to the community housing sector. Uh, and that is for funding for a, on a range of fronts. That includes obviously building new social housing sector, that uh, houses, that's also about uh, refurbishments, of social housing, and also importantly, a maintenance and works for Aboriginal controlled organisations in remote communities. So that's 93 million in direct grants out of the $319 million uh, SHERP program that will support the community housing sector. So before I hand over to questions, I do hope that you get this sense that there is a uh, myself as my minister and the team, there is a sense of urgency that we are going through line by line uh, on every uh, potential vacant house and whether we can bring it back into the system, that we are driving a more accelerated public and uh, housing delivery program, that we're trying to cut the red tape uh, on procurement, that we are looking in a really serious way about our land holdings to, to maximise um, that social housing uh, lift and gain back for the state, that we are seriously grappling with that tenant mix and support programs and particularly providing support to those in needs. There is a real uh, reform program there that we are genuinely driving uh, to get better and stronger outcomes and ultimately, for two key tasks, to increase the social housing uh, numbers and stock and to reduce, uh, obviously, the waiting list and particularly the priority waiting list. 
I will leave it there and then happy to take any questions. Um, we're down to one microphone, so we're going to have to share. Is that okay? Okay. Um, well, firstly, uh, thank you for your speech, and um, uh, I'll take some questions from the floor. We've got a couple of questions from Zoom. Um, because the people on Zoom can only hear the microphone, if you, I'll repeat the question. Is that okay? Great. We've got a question down here. Yep. Sorry. Well, that's a, a really good question, and I do think uh, we can do better. I'll be frank, I think we can do better. Uh, and it's clear to me, I even watch the uh, Homes West Facebook groups. Yes, I'm a bit of a nerd. I do look at tenant feedback and what people are saying about uh, the public housing system. I, I have to say this, though, when I've gone out to the regions, uh, I think it's about re what I'm trying to do is reset the central office. Because when I go out to the regions, I do see incredible frontline staff from the social housing system who are working their guts out to keep tenants in. And I really say that genuinely. I know sometimes uh, tenants and the staff can have that us versus them mentality. From, but from what I'm witnessing, uh, in terms of the regional staff, they're working their guts out to keep people in the tenants, in the, in the public housing system. But I do think you're right. I do think there is an opportunity of, about how we can better consult, engage with, in effect, I, I don't like using clients, uh, but the people that we serve. You're absolutely right. I don't think, uh, I think probably successive governments haven't had that as a focus. I mean, I'm open to how we do that because sometimes just sending, as you know, you can do a tick and flick a bot, which is you send out an online survey, 10 people fill it out, and then it's done and dusted. So I'm open to ideas about how we could best do that. Okay. Thanks. I can see that and I like your energy. Great. Um, we have another question from the floor, I think. Yep. Yes. Thank you, John. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, are you proceeding, <clears throat> proceeding with the idea that every time you have a, an application for an apartment block, 10% of that those units should be made, made over to social housing. We had that discussion when you first became a member, and I'm so pleased that you are now our housing minister. So good on you. So that's a very good question. What we have at the moment is different uh, government agencies can have different percentages. I think people would be aware the MRA has around 12%. I am sincere about this, that um, there are challenges so obviously, as the Minister for Public Housing, I'm trying to get that up. But when you do test it in the market, uh, there are some complexities because obviously already uh, we do spot purchasing uh, and as part of uh, our extra funding announcement. But when you test it in the developments, and there are some developments in the city where we have got public housing purchases, you get absolute resistance from the de developers to lift it. And it's based on this view. That is, we will not be able to sell the other apartments because there is too much social housing in the building. Now, that is a truth. It is a difficulty, but it is a truth. And we try to work with those developers uh, to see how we can lift it. But we get that feedback. And they also say, actually, We've already promised in this joint development already, so agreements say, for example, with Development WA, we've already agreed to this particular arrangement and now you want more social housing. Well, we've made promises to our customers 
that there will not be more social housing or community housing in this area. They don't mind affordable housing, so they're very open to nurses or those in that area, but as soon as you put the word S or P in front of it, uh, it's difficult. And I've I think I am the first minister that's called it out to say everyone supports public and social housing. I've said this in, in, in the parliament, as long as it's not next to them, behind them, in front of them, or probably within one kilometre of them. Now, we've got to try to tackle that public perception. So yes, I do support lifting the social housing mix policy. There's got to be some nuances there, but it is a challenge. Don't think it's a walk in the park it really is a challenge to convince de developers to lift it. Thanks. And uh, we have another question at the back and then one more at the front. Um, thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your presentation. Um, a question about uh, the housing tenure where about 30% of the population live, which is private rental. Of course, it's much higher in the other ages. You may get 60 or 70% in the 25 and above. Uh, 25 to 35. I'm just interested in what you see your role is in the reform of a private rental system that is fundamentally broken, that is a 20th century system in the 21st century, and it needs fundamental reform. The reform of the RTA is just one part of that. So I'm interested in knowing what you see your role is in relation to the reform of the private rental sector and where else in government um, that reform process is likely to be initiated. Thank you. Okay, look, and, and that is a very good question. Um, as you'd be aware, uh, in terms of the overall rental market, we do know from the Bank West Curtin Economic Report that there will be about 10,000 new rentals coming onto the system uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. And I think we'd all welcome that in this room. In terms of the reform, you're right, we're doing a review of the Act uh, as we speak. And that sits within, within uh, the Minister for Commerce, which is the right, which is the right space. So obviously I do support our reform of the Act. Uh, and personally, I would like to see that tenants feel safe and secure in their homes. I do want to say this, though, that as the Minister for Housing, uh, people see me from everything from key starter, private rentals, right through to public and social housing. I suppose my message is I am unashamedly focused on increasing public housing and social housing. You know, you can't do it all as a minister. And I have a Minister for Commerce who is responsible for review of the Tenancy Act. So I suppose I feel like we have the affordable housing mix. We've seen huge uptake, as I've indicated, uh, with those rentals coming through. For me, it needs to be, and I've made it very clear to the agency, uh, and I think this has been a long-term policy where the agency has been focused on affordable homes, on that mix. I've made it re resolutely clear it's Social, 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 and did I say social? Every time they walk into a meeting with me, they know that's what I'm gonna grill them about. So absolutely believe we need reform to that act, but ultimately my job is to lift, to boost, to grow that social housing sector. Thanks, we actually have a question on Zoom. Thank you. Um, could the minister please indicate the number of additional social houses to come on stream over the next three years? Well, uh, we are going through a, a budget process uh, right now, uh, or coming to the end of it, I should say. Uh, and in terms of the delivery numbers, that will be uh, reset as part of the budget process. We do have uh, a state housing strategy, which is uh, for an extra 2,600 homes in the system or a 6% increase. Great, thanks. And I think we might have one, uh, one question from the front and one at the back, and that's it. If you can be quick, be quick, quick. I like what you were saying about taking a more strategic approach across government to deliver better outcomes. 
Um, I wanted to follow on from your comments about the construction boom, because in the last couple of decades working with the sector, it seems the only time we've really got the political momentum for more investment in social housing has been at the peak of the boom. So have you thought about taking account of cyclical strategy and being actually able to say to developers, here's a price point at which we'd like to build social housing. When you can see you're, gonna, you're losing work, you're gonna have to lay off staff. How much staff can you build cheaply and effectively for us? So we make sure that we're actually smoothing out the economy, not contributing to the boom and bust cycle and getting less housing for our money. Look, I think you make a really good point. I mean, that is the fear that we currently face is about value for money. So as I've indicated, it's already been on the public record. When we've gone out to get money out the door for our refurbishment programs, you A, are waiting for a quote, or B, they're escalating their costs. So obviously I do want value for, for money. So on two things, the Premier's already flagged as an overall approach for government. We are looking at that smoothing out in terms of some of our major infrastructure works that may be putting pressure on the system and greater demand and competing obviously for social housing delivery. So I think you will see a smoothing out of those projects. And yes, in the social uh, housing and public housing sector, that's what I'm looking at is how do we create a very clear pipeline of work beyond this boom? And you know, this, the housing sector tells me probably in the next 12 to 18 months, we, the boom uh, will in effect be over. Of course, if the opening of international borders does occur and, and so forth, who knows, there could be another uplift in uh, population uh, intake. But yes, uh, as part of the policy setting, I am looking beyond these first two current years in our, in our second term to looking in the outer years about a delivery program that is focused around social housing. Thanks, Minister. And the final question from the floor for time. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> um, I contacted our members across WA, Jane Chilcott from Link West, Community Resource Centres and Neighbourhood Centres, Malawa, Denmark, Walpole, Mikathara, Durian Bay and Northcliffe all got back to me to highlight the issues of housing and homelessness in those areas, and in particular for the staff of those community services. So those, um, those organisations, those people I would very much welcome the, you know, the, your idea of modular. I think I think that was something that they came up with as an idea. Following on from the first question, they would love to you to go and visit them and talk to them on the ground in those organisations to hear what's happening um, in those communities and would really welcome and would love to know what the strategy is, particularly around small regional towns, yeah. around housing and homelessness. Thank you. So uh, I've, I've, as I've already flagged, we've been trying to reform all the programmes. Uh, and so one element is obviously looking at how we can use modular programs and particular for regional communities, because we actually do, and I mean, depending on the town, it is very particular. So for example, Ger Geraldton, my understanding is doesn't have a land supply issue. Uh, whereas other, other towns, it's about land supply or it's about the preference of where the land is. So for example, uh, there is a strong preference for land in Port Headland rather than South Headland because of these higher concentrations of, of social housing in those areas. But we are already looking at uh, the land holdings in those regional towns and where we can get modular uh, onto those areas. We're also, the other element is grow housing. Uh, and this is another example, just a small change of reform, which I do want to show is that grow housing, there's about 5,040 grow houses in the system. Uh, we've seen an increase of 127 in the last financial year. What I've looked at uh, and directed the agency to do is to say where there is long standing grow stock, so that is government regional housing stock that has been sitting vacant and is not in demand or meets the eligibility requirements uh, is to convert it um, to social housing. Now, it seems obvious, I don't know why people didn't look at it before, but I'll give you an example. Collie, 
uh, the agency is converting six units that were sitting vacant for a period of time, weren't meeting the demand or needs of government regional housing program. They will be refurbished as part of our $319 million program and provide much needed single bedroom units into the system. Might not light your world, but for me, that's actually exciting that I've got a department now that is looking and driving and seeking out those opportunities to boost the social housing stock. That's what I want to see um, my agency to do is that every opportunity where we see something like that, where it can be a change, uh, let, let's grab it uh, because that will change people's lives. Uh, and I'm really pleased that they're looking at other grow housing. We're not gonna be doing a mass transfer. And you know, every decision we make, I'll be frank, I'll cop it. The opposition will probably come out and attack me for depleting grow housing. Well, actually I would argue it's, it is a, a, a very reasonable and logical use in, in the current demand and pressures for housing. Thank you. And thank you, Minister. Um, we really have to wrap it up there, but you could thank the Minister again. I uh, just want to thank the Minister uh, one more time and also to thank Arnie Marie Taylor for her welcome to country. Um, thank you for being in the audience this morning, getting up early, braving the cold, eating out of a paper bag, all those things. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the people on Zoom, um, hopefully having a sit down breakfast. Um, I'd like to thank the Shelter WA team for putting this together, for hassling and hustling technology every time they do this. Thank you. And if you're not currently a member of Shelter, it's not too late. You can join. Uh, there are a number of people wearing Shelter t-shirts. You can talk to them and we'll give you a form. It'll be very simple for you. Um, so that concludes uh, this morning's breakfast. Thanks again and uh, see you at the next one. Bye-bye.